Welcome to the WP Tonic This Week in WordPress and SaaS podcast, where Jonathan Denwood interviews the leading experts in WordPress, e-learning, and online marketing to help WordPress professionals launch their own SaaS. Welcome back, folks, to this month's WP Tonic WordPress and Tech Roundtable show. We've got some great stories to discuss. We've got a great panel. Um, unfortunately, Jeff Chandler had to um, not be with us. He's got a seem to have a terrible cold, so I, I released him from his duty. And Heather, Heather's sunning herself somewhere, so um, she won't be joining us. But we got a great panel. We got um, we're going to be discussing Google. We're going to be d- discussing the state of the word from the great leader. We're going to be discussing um, WP Water Cooler again. And we're going to be discussing Mark Adrason and the enemy, whoever is the enemy. I do not know. Uh, um, so we've got some great stories. Um, I'm going to let the panel introduce them. We've got a great special guest. Um, we've got Lee Blue with us. So, Lee, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm Lee Blue. I've been using WordPress for a really long time. <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I put a WordPress e-commerce plugin together called Card66, and that went great for about 12 years. And um, the past five years, I've been doing a lot of business coaching with web designers over at lee.blue, <laughs> if you want to find me over there. That's great. I've got, I've got the goat of WordPress. I've got Spencer. So, Spencer, would you like to introduce yourself? First of all, I'm very happy to meet Lee because I know your name, but of all the people, I see you're 15 and raise you three more. As long as I've been in WordPress, I've seen your name around and uh, I'm glad to finally meet you. Plus, I like the metaphor because if you were Lee Red or Lee Yellow or, you know, you <laughs> you at least have the matching blue behind you. So it does, it's catching. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, this is Spence, master of trivial knowledge of things people don't care about from WPLaunchify.com and a continuing thorn in Jonathan Dunwin's paw. But that's why he loves me. Now, I, I'm, I know my place. I'm just a donkey. So there we go. I've uh, um, uh, got my friend Chris, Chris Badger from Lifter LMS. Would you like to introduce yourself, Chris? Hey, Jonathan, and nice to meet you, Lee. I'm Chris from Lifter LMS. It's a learning management system for WordPress. And I have a podcast for course creators and WordPress pros called LMS Cast. And you got a new dog on your team. Are you training him? Oh, right so cute. Your puppy's so cute. Yeah, she's a border collie. She actually just left the office, but she's been amazing so far. Just got her down in Pennsylvania when I was visiting my business partners. All right. How's the e learning going with her? She's uh, not that much into online education, but I will say the way Border Collies, um, you know, they key in on people. I find that she likes to watch movies and, you know, there's just a lot of eye contact going on. It's a pretty cool breed. All right, there we go. I've got my um, normal co-host for the other WP Tonic shows, um, Kurt. Would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Yeah, sometimes I think I'm just the mouse that takes the Spencer thorn out of Denwood's paw. Um, <laughs> sure. That would be true. So, uh, I own Banyana Nomas. It's, a, it's an agency that focuses largely on membership and learning sites, and I run the Banyana Nomas podcast. And I, too, am blown away by Lee's background. I'm, I'm looking at the screen, and I'm thinking, I've got to do a lot of work on my background if I'm going to keep doing this. Thing. It is very impressive, isn't it? There we go. All right, before we go into the meat and potatoes of this great show, um, we've got uh, a couple of messages from our major sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments. Are you looking for ways to make your content more engaging? Sensei LMS by Automatic is the original WordPress solution for creating and selling online courses. Sensei's new interactive blocks can be added to any WordPress page or post. For example, interactive videos let you pause videos and display quizzes lead generation forms, surveys, and more. For a 20% off discount for the tribe, just use the code WPTONIC, all one word, when checking out and give Sensei a try today. We're coming back, folks. I want to point out 
We've got some great special offers from the major sponsors, plus a created list of the best WordPress plugins to help you build fabulous websites for your clients. You can find all these goodies by going over to wp-tonic.com slash deals. wp-tonic.com slash deals, and you find all the goodies there. What more could you ask for? Probably a lot, but that's all you're going to get from that. Five dollars. That's what I would ask for. What was that? Five dollars. Five dollars about what? You said what else would I ask for? That would be it. Oh, that's cheap from you. Right, there we go. Uh, um, So off we go. Off we go into the stories. Um, Well, I've started off with um, the state of the word 2023 that will be broadcast live from Madrid. December the 11th. I really don't know why it why this is still happening apart apart from it's a jolly to Madrid. What do you reckon, Chris? I think they used to have it just before uh, Word Camp USA, didn't they? I could understand. I don't understand the purpose of this anymore. What do you think, Chris? I was actually reminiscing the other day with somebody how I missed it being a big part of WordCamp US. It was kind of like the keynote at the uh, end of the event, right before the after party. And it had, uh, it's a big leadership opportunity. I remember when Matt did a presentation on Gutenberg, and I believe we were in Nashville at the time. And I thought it was a great, you know, state of the word uh, kind of presentation. And I'm not sure I understand the full logic to removing it to a separate thing. At the recent WordCamp uh, US, it, it, what's filled its place is more of a Q&A, which is also valuable. It's sort of like what used to happen is the state of the word at the end when the audience would come up with questions. Now that whole segment is that. Um, so I don't really understand or the logic but behind like moving it out or at least moving it around i would rather see it move around the big events from like us to europe to asia uh when all those people are together mm. i do like the fact that they're doing it in madrid i think that uh it's important to move things around like i'd love to see wordcamp us happen in mexico city or vancouver canada and just keep mixing it up cuz wordpress really is a global audience and uh just kind of especially get more people involved in different countries in those regions but uh, yeah, that's all I got to say about that. So, what what do you reckon, Kurt? Uh, it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to me um, at the present moment. Why why but have it there now? I I reckon Badget is a genius because if we could rally to have State of the Word and WordCamp US delivered from Vancouver, that would put us really really close to some awesome mountain bike. So I'm totally down for, for, for working in the U.S. going to Canada. Totally down. Um, honestly, I don't care where the state of the word comes from. And maybe I'm just so new to the overall, you know, overarching community aspect of, of being involved at this level. But the guy makes a statement. They broadcast it live. We can all see it. I really don't care where it comes from, uh, you know, because it's. It, we're, we're all embracing this work remote and, you know, don't do the back to the office mm-hmm. thing and. It is what it is. Guy can talk from wherever he wants. We can see it. We get the message. And uh, from that, I just want to really campaign for this Canadian word camp thing. I think we can do that. I want to go mountain biking again at Whistler. Oh, there you go. Um, so, Lee, um, well, they used to, he used to, like, like what Chris said, he used to have this speech during World, uh, word camp USA. Or I don't know why he couldn't make this speech. Uh, uh, word camp europe uh, or i have no idea why it's become a separate event um so i, I differ to kirk i don't really follow the logic you got any thoughts about this lee it's kind of cool that they've got i think the more stuff the more events that are out there the more we can talk about it and, you know gives us two chances to talk about wordpress instead of just one which is kind of cool uh, I'd love to see the word camps start back up a little bit more. Like I used to go to a bunch of word camps, you know, before the pandemic and everything, and then they sort of died off. And I'd love to see the word word camps come back a little bit more. What do you guys think about that? Did you go to Maryland? I don't remember seeing you. I've been to um, 
Yeah, I went to one in Baltimore maybe twice. No, I mean the the big one. The when we were just there a couple months ago. I, no, no, I was. I haven't been since the pandemic. Oh, okay. I would have remembered meeting you. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I would I hope we, you remember it was, you a, too. it was large but surprisingly small at the same time because you know there was like tens of thousands of people, but <clears throat> managed to bump into almost everybody. Yeah. That's I just love going. I've made so many friends. I, I go to the one down in uh, Raleigh. There used to be one in Raleigh a lot that I would go to and met so many people that I liked there. And um, I've even presented there a couple of times. And I just miss, you know, because I kind of miss my friends. <laughs> you know, I just miss seeing people. So, Spencer, what's your position on this? Well, I think Chris really said it well. And international destinations, especially that have nice scenic, opportunities and kurt's comment biking or skiing would be awesome as well um yeah i'm all for it i don't i i don't have any grudge with matt that i have to say beyond what i say in twitter all day long but like what i do feel happens quite often especially with the development cycle and some of the politics and some of the rest is it seems rather happenstance the way that this whole setup is working now 18, 19 years later versus the company that's running half the internet you think would have more of a structure similar to every year these things happen in these ways with these people just like development but you can see on a daily basis that it's clearly being run like i don't know like high school musical like a, a high school you know glee club like a high school uh what do you call it? You know, student body government. It's just, there's no level of high professional organization. And I think that it's long overdue because quite frankly, we really demand or command a lot of, of space in the internet. And yet we're still being run like this sort of pseudo weird, benevolent sort of malevolent dictatorship. Uh, I'll tell you what I want to tell you. It's going to do this. Like, there's just so much uncertainty. So I'm not dramatic here. I could care less where it comes from, like Kurt said. But it just seems when I have to explain to other people how we do stuff, that I'm apologetic more than I am proud, at least in, in terms of the actual or uh, way it's run. You get used to it, Spence. So I've had to apologize. Oh, you know, I've had to have that conversation, aren't we? I mean, you know, that is- like like the, the uncle who happens to have started a billion dollar company, but has a little drinking problem or something like he sits at all the family events, but you can't deny the success that he's got, but you have to explain he's not really angry. He's just had a couple too many. Yeah. Like I was saying, you know, apologizing. Oh, I've got used to it because I've had to apologize about myself all my life. So, uh, um, so there we go. But um, yeah, I do, I do see where you're coming from. He has, you know, you know, if I was in Matt's shoes, so going off to Madrid and, you know, doing a little speech, it sounds pretty cool. It's got a bit like it was done at the last minute and all his buddies, all the chosen can go to Madrid and listen to the wise leader and they have a bit of a party, won't they? So Maybe Tim Ferriss will be there. And- yeah, I'm sure he will be the penguin man. I call him... Um, I call him the penguin man the, because he had an interview with the great leader in... Antarctica, Antarctica, uh, a few months ago, like like you do, Lee. You know, you go off to some godforsaken spot to do a podcast. You know, yeah. um, there we go. Um, let's go on to another story. Um, things are getting hot for Google. Um, the the Justice Department don't seem to think they um, they seems to think they do do evil. Um, so, Lee, what was your views on on this? Man, I had a lot of thoughts about this because I run a lot of ads for myself and for my clients, and a lot of them are on the Google platform, sometimes on, on the Meta platform, but we mostly shipped entirely over to Google. And it was really eye-opening because I hadn't been following the, the legal case. I didn't realize the thing about them kind of shifting the prices of the ads to meet quotas and stuff like that. So that was kind of crazy. But the biggest thing that really stood out to me was... um. Google buying default search engine positions on Apple devices. It was like, I don't know about that. That's, that's, I really don't feel like you ought to sell default settings. I feel like if, like, um, if it was me, and it's, it's obviously not me, I'm not Apple, but if it were me, I would want 
the device people, like the Apple people, to be able to pick whatever default settings they want. Yeah, I kind of think about it in, in like three levels. Like one level is it's default. That's the highest one. The medium level would be some kind of like a settings thing where like as you're setting up your phone or whatever, you can pick which one you want and just like a one click pick kind of a thing. And then like the third level is you just go into the settings and just change to whatever you want. So I don't think there's any issues with like being on the one click pick settings page. Like maybe you can sell access to that. Whereas, uh, but like selling the default position, it makes it, it seems like it's really monopolistic and I don't, I don't really like that vibe too much. Oh, Google, mon- monomistic, never. Uh, um, Kurt, Kurt, what did you? You're just, you're just picking on me, Jonathan, because you know I'm going to come at this different. Well, that's what you're here. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't choose people that just going to agree with me. You're supposed to have a conversation. I know that's how, I know that's old fashioned and everybody just wants a load of people that agree with themselves. Uh, um, there we go. This topic's hard for me because I don't, like Google as a company, I don't like it's, it's, I'm not a fan of Google, but selling the, the default position on the iPhone, for example, that to me is no different than product placement to have a can of Coke on the dining room table in a movie. You know, it, it's corporations constantly paid to market to us and our eyes and they force it down our throats. And as I read the article that we're, that we're discussing, couldn't help but get that crabs in a bucket sensation like like you know they're they're climbing to the top of the bucket and all the smaller companies are grabbing them and going that's not fair that's not fair come back down to our level and um it, it, it's not fair right but then so many things in our world aren't fair like if i started a car company today and then wanted to sue i don't know hertz rental car because they still ordered more fords for their fleet than von Annen's for their fleet I would say, well, it's not fair. I should be able to sell as many cars as Ford, but Ford's been established. So it's, I have a really hard time when people have discussions in business about what's fair and what's not. Then, yeah, did they use inside knowledge to kind of, you know, rally their purpose? I'm sure they did. But the people that are going to make the call on this are also the same people that invest in all kinds of stocks that you and I wouldn't be allowed to invest in to better their bank accounts. So I don't see how this is going to be solved. Yeah. So, Spencer, um, why is all? What do you think all this is about? Because I was really surprised that the Justice Department has gone down. I thought they would never go down this route because um, I just thought Google was untouchable. So, what do you think all this is about, really? It reminds me of um, sometimes on the internet I'll see these images that are clickbaity, but it shows an old lion. It's all skinny and frail, and then it shows the hyenas and the jackals and the vultures all circling around. And it's that's, how I, that's how I feel, Spencer. That's how I feel most mornings. Uh, it shows that, and has like the, the tone that even the proud king of the jungle, when he starts to show vulnerability and weakness, becomes essentially outcast from the tribe, and then the jackals and the hyenas and the vultures start circling waiting for him to go down and that's it and i think we all know that schadenfreude is probably the number one thing that especially us westernized capitalists or americans love we love the schadenfreude the big big game you know leader goes down hard you know we elevate our heroes and then we crush them well i think ai has revealed the soft underbelly of Google and it's incredible monopoly. And there's some young guns over at the justice department who've decided, Hmm, I'm smelling a kill. And now is the time to go for it because before the entire internet would have suffered if Google went down hard, but now AI has revealed, Hey, you know what? I think we can do it just fine without Google because AI and Bing search and all these other things now are showing promise. That's what I think's underneath all this. And you can look at examples in past shows here. I've been, remember when I argued with Rand Fishkin about how SEO is a bunch of bullshit and AMP is bullshit and all the other things bullshit. And Rand was like, I don't understand you, Spencer. You're crazy. Well, he went off and started a new company that basically he talks all day long about how Google's full of shit. And that's the point. Google's been full of shit forever, making us all bow to the altar of what they tell us to do while constantly changing their mind. 
So if I was in the Justice Department, I would go for them too. Let's take them down a notch because if it extends into the actual mechanics of devices, whatever. No, I'll extend this into WordPress uh, gratuitously because I was working with a client this morning and it seems that the chocolate factory has grown an even bigger set of cojones because one of their plugins, <clears throat> Insights, something Insights, has 12 links in the menu. Seven of them are upsells for their other products. How do you say that? I'm surprised. They, I mean, like, say that. I was, I'm, I'm surprised. surprised they, say that. I'm saying it's exactly the same behavior. Google thinks they can get away with murder. The chocolate factory thinks they can get away with murder. And if we're really looking at who's going to monitor it, it's either got to be regulation or it's got to be the user base or the peers. We're all basically deciding what kind of world we want to live in. And if all of us are driving on the right side of the road, but the big monster thinks they can come in and go on any direction they want, all the rest of us will suffer. So again, I'm not a communist. I'm a capitalist, but I'm saying, Capitalism requires that we have rules that we all abide by. Otherwise, the game isn't fun to play, just like Monopoly. And that's it. That's what's happening in my view. Hey, that's all I got to say about that. So, Chris, um, I think it would be beneficial for Google and for the shareholders that it was broken up. I think more, more, um, more revenue would um, go to the shareholders if it was split up. And I actually think the search part should be like Mozilla um, in a foundation. I don't, I don't think it should be controlled by the government, but it should be a non-profit foundation. And the rest of it um, can be commercial businesses. And I think it would generate more income for the shareholders. I, I, I think that would be the best solution for this situation. Well, that's, that, that's just my opinion. What, what do you think, Chris? I think it's complicated and really it's up to the technology companies to innovate. We haven't had a major, you know, breakup of a conglomerate in a long time in the US to my knowledge. And you know, it why hasn't DuckDuckGo, you know, emerged as a superior solution? Uh I think it is good that like ChatGPT and Microsoft is pushing ahead with their AI products you know is somewhat disruptive to google's pole position <laughs> but it's really just a balance of free market economics i like to believe that the users of these products are going to ultimately make the decision i personally choose google search and i use google chrome for my browser because for me it's the best solution i'm not if my iphone came with safari as the default browser i would change it to you know, uh, so I, I believe the users are not, uh, you know, have the intelligence to figure it out themselves. Paying for premium placement, I agree with Kurt, is really just kind of business as is in terms of product placement. But uh, I would like to see more disruption in the space. And I think that's the ultimate issue is can a small company actually enter today and compete on search? Is that even possible? And if it's not, there might, there might be an issue there. Okay. All right. Uh, right. On to the next one. I was in two. But, um, right. Um, we've had another episode from the water cooler. Um, sorry. Um, seems still to be really upset. Um, so, Spencer. Um, I was in two minds, but you know, we are, in some ways, I'm glad that this sh this particular part of WP Tonic has become monthly, because I was getting a little bit, I was getting a bit bored because we were having a Groundhog episode almost every episode. Spencer, um, we were discussing the same thing, and I, I just don't fundamentally see anything really changing in the near. So what was your response to this episode from the WP or the cooler? I mean, you know, the, the primary topic was like the governance thing. And am I saying her name right when I say say? say? So, I say say area, but say you're probably, yeah. So, I mean, this came a little later than the, the drama that led to her Twitter. 
collision on the highway, a uh, hijacking, whatever. But essentially, for those who don't know, she's a, a very intelligent person who's been a very, I think, well-known and respected contributor to the WordPress community and all those things on the back end. And Matt woke up and didn't have his meds and decided to not only attack her, but like go after her in a, what I would suggest would be an out of balance at best, maybe even misogynistic way. It was unusually cruel for no good reason. And then he went on a rampage with a bunch of other people who he felt, uh, he could judge the level of their contribution to the community individually, which again, I go back to the whole idea. We see this with billionaires. Matt may or may not have a billion dollars, but he's definitely exemplifying the magnification behavior that we see of human beings who have a lot of money, where whatever it is about that relationship of money or power or exposure, their worst and best behaviors become magnified. And his attack on her was the worst of human behaviors, but more importantly, it, you know, as I keep saying, pulled back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz, where he gives one perso persona in public, but we've all seen historically before he was Matt Mullenweg, the, the, the Wizard of Oz, his real nature is like a regular Joe. Like he used to go at people's throats if he didn't like what they said. Well, that's always been him. He's just been pretending to be this other guy. And this unfortunately revealed it for the rest of us. So my takeaway then, my takeaway now, my takeaway that I said even at the beginning of the show is <clears throat> we, the makers, the people who really, truly have created WordPress over all these years, we own WordPress, not Matt Mullenweg. And they have set up essentially two columns. We have set up two, hold on. We've set up two columns, the WordPress.org, and then there's .com and Automatic. And as far as I'm concerned, we don't really need to spend much time discussing Matt Mullenweg. Because all the things we need, we have ourselves. We have the people, the places, the organization, the politics, the software. We just have to decide to take over control of it. And whatever else happens, it doesn't have to be a battle. It can just be, we just go, you know, la, 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 and don't listen to any of this nonsense. Same thing with the governments. We'll see what he says in Madrid. But does it really matter? Because even as of two days ago, there were some posts about, why is it that the WordPress administrative dashboard with Gutenberg working so well, why do they keep changing the names of everything? Why do they keep changing the position of things? Yesterday or day before was a good conversation with many of our pals in there about why is the default setting for WordPress when you're in the editor to go full site, full screen? And it turns out because Matt Mollowig said it should be that way. And all the rest of us were like, but the default behavior isn't obvious and you keep moving the controls for this and oh, nobody knows you can filter it. And it seems to be, well, if enough people complain to Matt, maybe he'll let somebody change it. But otherwise, he's decided. And I find that really odd. Like, half the internet uses the software, but Matt decides. Because that sounds a lot like Elon Musk and Twitter. And that's not really what he's saying in public. He's not saying that it's his thing. He's saying it's our thing, but in reality, it's his thing. And well, that's that's kind of weird. So, Chris, um, i tell you what Spencer says, but I... I um... I I think Spencer. I understand where Spencer's coming from, but I think I think uh, Matt has all the IP control, the intellectual property to to some degree. Or oh, yeah, it's open source, um, and that murk, murk, murks the water a bit. But fundamentally, him and and his team at Automatic, they run it all, really, don't they, Chris? It's all. I'm surprised the water cooler people, I think they knew this. I think it suited their purpose, Tucker and her and all the rest of them to go along with it. And now it doesn't suit them. So they make out it's a big surprise. Everybody knew that he run and automatic run it all. So I find it all a bit bizarre, Chris, really, to be truthful about it. Well, it's a complex 20 year old project. And uh, I think one argument would be if you want things to change, you know, contribute, like get involved. And even this show we're making right here is a contribution to the WordPress media space. It's not just about submitting code and, and stuff like that. What I'd love to see is um, even if it were just a test or potentially run in parallel is to use technology that exists today, like the DAO, the the 
decentralized autonomous organization where every WordPress user has an equal vote. And sure, someone might figure out how to game the system, but at least there could be a better way for people to govern or express ideas on what they want. And even if we keep the same power structures in place, at least let's clarify what the masses really do want. And if we could figure out a way to um, make those votes equal based on being a user, I think that would be pretty cool. Even if it doesn't like replace the existing structure, at least give a place for everybody to have an equal voice. Right. So, um, Lee, I just think people in the WordPress community just bought into Matt's nonsense, basically. Now, the reality is, I don't know if you're aware, Lee, that Automatic took almost $900 million of VC investment over six rounds of investment. The reality is it wasn't for that almost $900 million investment um, WordPress wouldn't have 50% share of the internet. Um, so it's a kind of open source, but it isn't really, because almost no other open source project had $900 million of investment in it. So these people that buy into Matt's nonsense, um, well, you just have to look at where the money came from, really. That's my position. What do you think, Lee? I met up with Matt maybe five or six years ago at a WordCamp. Actually, I think, I think it was WooConf, actually. And um, it was right around the time when Gutenberg was coming to life. And I remember thinking at the time that there's, that, that represented a real split in the, like, the WordPress population because he was saying um, it was just like a, like a one-on-one conversation like after one of his talks. So this wasn't like, like a public announcement of anything that he was making you were just talking and uh but he was saying that he felt like that wordpress was losing ground to like medium and like other blogging platforms because the wordpress editor was really complicated to use and it wasn't really user friendly for people who weren't techie people like us or like like me i was i read a lot of plugins for wordpress and everything and then i remember thinking at the time that's really weird because That, like, out of all the problems that I've ever had with WordPress, learning how to use the editor was not one of them. Like, there's a lot of, like, plugin conflicts and, like, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on and, like, understanding how the loop works and everything that was, uh, that causes me a lot more trouble. But then the problem was it really created this schism in the, in the, in my world of WordPress because as a plugin developer, it was really hard to know, like, if you're going to build a plugin that interacts with the admin area of WordPress, what are you supposed to do? Because is it going to be Gutenberg? Is it going to be the default classic editor? Is it going to be some kind of third party editor, like how Divi rearranges the whole thing, or whatever? It's like, how are you supposed to know how to put buttons and stuff to let people add short codes in and, and just do things if you don't really know what environment you're coding for? And so, like, that was like, when I was talking to him, like, I was thinking, well, now that we're introducing Gutenberg into the mix, that's really going to make it even harder for developers to know how to build plugins that interact in with stuff. And then, and he's out there talking about medium and using like a more, like an easier environment for, I guess, like maybe the democratization of publication or something like that. And I was like, wow, we're, we're in totally separate camps now because I'm kind of in this developer camp building WordPress plugins for other WordPress developers who create WordPress sites for their clients. And the clients never themselves ever do anything in WordPress. They just have the website and enjoy the leads and the contacts and stuff that come from it. And then he's thinking about it more as like like a communication channel for non-techie people. And like at that point, I just noticed that there's this giant divide between like my world of how I interact with WordPress and my clients and everything and like other people that are just using it like, like Medium or something like that. What do you guys think about that? Like, have you noticed that kind of schism or that divide as well? Because it's his vehicle for other things. Now, two days ago, a week ago, he bought something that looked interesting to me, that text uh, platform. Now, hmm. Tumblr, give me a break, but uh, I do use that podcast thing. So what I envision what's going on is what you're talking about, too, is that he's been put on a pedestal of a lot of money and a bunch of investors that they've got a brand and he's perceived as this boy guru. So what they're trying to do is milk it so they can put the equity capital into all kinds of other businesses and investments. 
And when he was talking that nonsense, it's the Gutenberg here, there, and everywhere thing. To lead a better life. The idea is it's not about WordPress. It's about what can they develop and then put their hooks into all kinds of other things, right? So it's really weird when you're in the WordPress project to be, what? what? Well, I see he focusing on getting this project finished. I think it's because he's got the pressure from all these investors of like, hey, we give you a shit ton of money. Go out and buy a bunch of stuff like every other company does that has a shit ton of money so we can, you know, put chips all over the roulette board and hope for our number to come up. That's it. It just seems clear to me because he's so detached from any realities of managing this as his focus. But yet, unlike Elon Musk, he has zero monetization success. Starlink, Fortune, SpaceX, Fortune, Tesla, Fortune, even Solar City, Fortune. Elon Musk is a lunatic, but everything he does seems to make money. Mullenweg hasn't made dime one other than by leeching off the hosting business of his own people that painted his fence and kicking him off their homepage. And I think that's kind of a sad testament 18 years later that he's going off saying these oddball things and buying oddball companies instead of like, how about spending some of that money on paying people to actually run the goddamn project like a real company? Never. Like, seriously. I oh, mean, no doesn't one. it seem odd that not a dime of the capital has been spent on hiring a real board of directors, a real C-suite of people, real people with marketing experience? Why is it all a bunch of amateur hour people being asked to contribute their time and then crack the whip on people and companies because Matt says you didn't contribute enough time? Meanwhile, he does differently for himself. It's just odd. And it's not really... To me, I don't, I don't think it's odd at all if you can find people that that's prepared to work for you for nothing. It's transparent, you, is what I'm. You saying. know, you know, you're going to give up on that business model, are you? That that's a very good if you find a load of people to work for you for nothing. You're just gonna... I listen. Sorry, do you guys listen to Guy Raz? How I built this. Listen to that show. It's incredibly well produced. But one of the things you hear again and again and again and again is that any company with this long of an existence and this much money behind it has long ago taken the CEO off the chair unless they happen to be an amazingly unique individual and put professional people in place. Here, that's not happening. Well, it's not going to happen because, you because know, of this. Yeah. So, um, Kurt, um, so I don't know if you listen to the podcast, but. You know, they went off on this thing, it's open source, we can go off on our own, blah, blah, blah. It's all fantasy, isn't it? Uh, you know, you know, um, it's never gonna happen. And it it's a, I just I just think it's a bit sad that when people start they're not accepting the reality that him and him up running things is he owns everything. He owns all the IP, all the branding, the he owns WordPress.org. He owns Automatic. Um, he is it, basically. What do you reckon, Kurt? Well, to steal a page out of Mr. Badgett's book, I'm going to go with this whole thing is a very complicated issue. <laughs> um, I did listen to the podcast. And as I listened to them, and I tried to focus on, like, fact that they were trying to because they were talking a lot about emotions, but I was trying to pulse out some fact that they were talking about. And I was listening to that. And then I quite honestly listened to the, to the board here. And one of the things that I'm constantly driven back to, and maybe it's because I was in WordPress since 2004, but I wasn't in WordPress until just a few years ago. And so I go back to this giant, silent majority of people that use WordPress that don't have a care in the world and aren't aren't affected by any of these conversations. And then I see this small microcosm of people that get super excited and super fired up about it. And you know what? If we don't like who's running it, if we don't like what's happening and there's enough of us that want to get together and make a change, we could make a change, Jonathan. I mean, I know that you say, no, we can. It's too far along. It's too big. It's too this. It's too big to fail. Oh no! It's yeah. just that he owns everything. Sure, you know? but it's it's open source, and you could scrape off some of that, and and you could improve it, and you could do stuff on your own, and launch your own thing, and have your own committee, and you could run it with as many different people groups as you wanted to, and you could do all kinds of cool things. But it's it's the idea of we could 
get online and complain about it, or we could put our feet down and take action for it. And that's where the taking action part takes capital, takes money, and takes those things that people are uncomfortable talking about. But someone has to be in charge. Someone has to run it. Someone has to organize it. A couple shows ago, I remember Spencer was kind of like launching a campaign. He wanted to run. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. he's in. I'm. What I've ended up doing is what I said I would do, because number one, all of us can only do within our own social circles. I happen to have lots of friends, and that's why I'm very fascinated when I haven't met somebody as charming as Lee, because the WordPress community is shockingly small when you think of how big of its reach. When we're at that event and there's 2,000 something people in a hotel of 10,000 other people, okay, I think I legitimately met almost every single person or bumped into somebody that I could think of or at least said hello. And that's shocking because if it's running half the internet and you can literally first name basis at 57 years old, that's saying something. But the other part about it is that in terms of the world, we can only do what we can do within our arm's reach. And if each of us does that thing by influencing those who are listening to us or speaking with us or sharing ideas, the momentum of that always builds. And right here, I have no personal grudge. I don't even have a desire to do anything that remotely resembles ad hominem attacks, but it's very, very, very clear that when you stack up all the facts, that the equity value to all of us who make our livelihood in WordPress is good enough, great enough, or fair enough for us to say, we don't need to have Matt Mullenweg tell us what to do because he lives and dies by the same thing he started with. It's open source. You can't, sorry, Matt, you set up the board game back in 2005 and six, and you said, rule one, genesis of the WordPress Bible. Open source is open source. And here's the GPL, blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm really sorry if now the rest of us have sort of woken up from the delusion that you're looking over our best interests first, because it's clear you're not. But I don't care what you do. I don't wish you anything other than success. But for the rest of us, what I have done is started to do that WordPress as a service. I've decided to say, we don't need 70,000 choices. We need a curated set of stuff and somebody to introduce it to the environment. Because I see the biggest problem to us who make our living as customers being confused as hell about what the hell is WordPress actually doing versus every single other SaaS company. It's so clear from the top down. It's it's a platform. That's what we can all do. And that's what I'm doing. And here I talk on these shows and I'm a little bit of an instigator. I'm willing to take the heat because I'm untouchable unlike some people who had to leave the show in the past because their jobs were threatened indirectly or directly by Matt. And I'm also happy to call out people like the Chocolate Factory, who I'm being gracious not saying his name, because his behavior is disgusting to me because it's unfair and it's bad for all of us in WordPress when that kind of behavior, black hat tactics happen because people use his stuff and then they end up thinking that it's a big spammy, scammy mess, just like Windows 95 was. And that's it. That's all I can do. And the rest of you do your part and the, we'll see which way the wind goes. But yeah. Hey, if you've got any complaints about what Spencer just said, please. All my words, not please, Jonathan first. Please send emails to Spencer. His email address. Happy is to address. Please do not send any emails to me because I want to point out some you, of his, views, his views are his views. I, I, I do, I do want to point out a couple things. First of all, one of the things I love is. We all got to hang out, bourbon and hey, okay. First of all, Chris and Kurt are very close. They work together, but we all hang out when we can. And we met in person. I love the differences of our personalities, right? Like Chris is the most super laid back dude. He is just like this in real life. And Kurt is like closer to me, but like a nicer version of me in some ways, but we have similar interests. I am the guy who I live and die by the sword of facts and truth. And I'm not afraid to say it. And I've publicly, we're going to do the story about Andreessen. I've publicly gone up against Mark Andreessen and I'm willing to do it when facts are on my side because I'm willing to go into the public forums and say, look, you may not like what I'm saying, but argue the facts. And here in this WordPress thing, it's just undeniable that the facts are there. And yet here's what's weird to me. When I say stuff in Twitter or on LinkedIn or one of those social networks, Mullenweg never addresses me publicly. Never. We're commenting on the same, he'll never say anything to me. And you know why? Because the facts are on my side. And the same with the chocolate factory owner. He'll never say anything in public because they know they can't address the facts. That's it. Well, and if they could address the facts, it would be 
very bad for what their position is. Yeah, I need to go for the break, but just two things. Thank you for that moment. But, uh, yeah, I think you just rant on here. I think you, I think you need to take the tablet. So I, I am not. I, that. I'm just saying, like we're having a conversation in this place. It's a good opportunity. Yeah, I need to go for the. You know, I need to go, go for the for break. Two comments. Um, the reason why they don't reply to your comments is they're too busy counting the money. And secondly, well, they're in the, uh, they're in the same space addressing other people, but they won't address my particular comments, and I think that's why. No, it's, they're just counting the money, and what you call facts, I call them Spencer facts. Um, they're they're uh, slightly different, uh, but there we go. Uh, um, we're going to go for our break. We will be back in a few moments, folks. This podcast episode is brought to you by Lifter LMS, the leading learning management system solution for WordPress. If you or your client are creating any kind of online course, training-based membership website, or any type of e-learning project, Lifter LMS is the most secure, stable, well-supported solution on the market. Go to lifterlms.com and save 20% at checkout with coupon code PODCAST20. That's PODCAST20. Enjoy the rest of your show. We're coming back, folks. I just want to point out, we've got a fabulous partner um, set up at WP Tonic. If you've got a customer website and they're looking to build a membership, learning management, or a buddy boss website, why don't you look at becoming a WP Tonic partner We've got a fab offering for you. All you have to do is to go over to wp-tonic slash partners, wp-tonic slash partners, and find out all the information there. We'd love you to become a WP Tonic development partner. So, on we go. On we go. Oh, yes. Mark, Jason, the enemy. I put there... In his um, techno optimistic manifesto, and part of it were the enemy. Um, there was a long list of enemies in this. So, Lee, what did you think of Mark's techno optimistic manifesto and the bit that this the enemy? I think I, I think I missed that link. I jumped straight down to the Twitter X one. No, I didn't read that one. Oh, right. I'm, I'm sorry about why. Right, let's move on. Let's go to Chris then. Chris, what did you think? I'm a fan of technology and, you know, there's a, and a fan of rapid technology innovation. And I love this fact that it was 66 years between the Wright brothers' first flight and landing on the moon. And we do, that's, that's just aviation. You know, when we do that in, education, software, computer science, hardware, vehicles. It's a good time to be alive. It's an exciting time to be alive. But I I think, I, I guess I'm more, like politically, I'm an independent. I don't take a side. I'm independent. I feel the same way about these issues. It's not that uh, capitalism party on one side and environmental policy or or social whatever on the other side. I just think the big challenge is how do we do all that together? How do we do rapid technological innovation that also makes society better, that's also good for the environment, and so on? So it's more, for me, it's just an issue of transcend and include. When somebody gets deep dogmatic on like an issue, um, they're often missing the opportunity to include the good parts of what's on the other side of that issue and move forward. So that's the way I see it. And I, I appreciate his voice in terms of uh, kind of pushing back against some of the uh, anti-capitalism, anti-technology um, stuff. But at the end of the day, everybody has their own choice. They can think what they can think. They can do what they want to do. They're, they can make their own consumer choices with their dollars. But there's often opportunity of taking the best of what looks like a polarized debate or dichotomy that's actually both have good points right um kurt this is um mark comes across unlike spencer i've never met him um but mark comes across as a very charming very intelligent individual but 
My take on this, Kurt, is that this is all garbage, really, in some ways. This is just about some geezer that it's all about the money, basically, and this guy just wants to make a load more money. So he, whatever, whatever particular position can enable him he's all and why i think i think it's like anybody that's a dick that's got an addiction you can never you never can satisfy it really and i think mark's addiction is making money and him and his wife own most of southern california um and all this is just positioning because he feels that especially ai that he might be, you know, not allowed to make the amount of money that he wants. Or am I being totally cynical, Kurt? It's human nature for people to want to make more, to be more, to be represented at a higher level. It's completely normal human behavior. Um, As I read the article, there's a lot of things that, that pop off. Like when something's called, you know, trust and safety, or tech ethics, or, you know, uh, you know, we just went through three years of, of people that were, you know, selecting misinformation topics for us. And we can see, you know, hindsight being 2020, that a lot of that guidance was incorrect. And when someone names something, the trust and safety department of whatever, um, I don't think it's very much centered on trust or safety. So I can kind of see his points. I wonder why I had to make a whole manifesto about it. Um, but we're not going to stop technology from rolling forward. And like Chris Badgett, yeah, I am, you know, an advocate for technology, but the way that the flawed creature, the human being utilizes technology, um, is many times incorrect. Social media was a great invention and look what we've done to it. You know, we've adulterated it with dopamine and likes and follows and, you know, all of a sudden Instagram models and only fans is the most popular thing on the internet. And that's not necessarily what those tools were built for. And AI isn't really built to replace all of our jobs and make us all obsolete. It's meant to enhance, you know, some of the skills that we come to the table with. I consider myself a writer, but I still use a lot of my founding tools now in AI to get my ideas started and start kicking that can down the road. Does that make me less of a writer? I don't believe it does. I think it makes me a writer that you know, uses the implementation of tools to get further down the road more quickly. And, um, but could I misuse it? Absolutely. So it's, it's one of those things where I think we all need to be cognizant of what technology is, what it can do, what its potential dangers are. And then unfortunately we have to hold ourselves accountable and and act accordingly. So Spencer, um, I, based on my experience, those that talk the most about free enterprise, in my, based on my experience, are those that are the most mo- monolistic, they didn't want a monopoly the most. Um, that's based on my experience. You know this guy. Um, I just want to know, how much money does he need, Spencer? You know, or is it... Is I don't it not like that anymore. Uh, my, I mean, he... I didn't really know him at University of Illinois. He was a couple years younger than me at the University of Illinois, but he famously made his money for inventing Netscape back in the days when we were using Mosaic, uh, Mosaic and things like Archie and, you know, weird stuff that seems very quaint now. And then he moved to Silicon Valley and got funding from some big, big, big investors back in the day, Jim, somebody and so forth and whatever, dinosaur age. Now, where he's at with Andreessen Horowitz is he's, He's done famously a lot of companies. I had a personal encounter with him indirectly through my social networking with a company, Ning, where he was one of the founders and uh, his girlfriend, Gina Bianchini, was running it. And it was before Facebook and it was before YouTube, but we were doing social networking. That's how I got my foothold after all that stuff imploded with WordPress because it taught me personally firsthand. I ended up in my mind on top how things really work. And how things really work was he had $100 million invested from his investors in LoudCloud. It didn't work. They renamed it Ning as a social network for anything. And the investors got annoyed that myself and one other guy figure out a way with permission to make money when they were doing freemium. And it wasn't him directly. I don't think he even was paying attention by that. But the point was 
they sick the lawyers out. They tried to crush the whole thing. And in doing so, they just exposed how things are actually working. There is a very closed circle of people, almost like like Eyes Wide Shut, that Stanley Kubrick movie, who have those parties with the weird hats on. There's a very small circle of people. Do you think one of those would suit me? I'm not surprised if he would be attending that because there's a very small circle of people, and this is human psychology. Tribalism works in a capitalistic way, too. The higher you get on the chain, the smaller the circle of people that you are interacting with because the higher you go, we're now in not millions or hundreds of millions or billions. We're in tens of billions, hundreds of millions. And he is in one of those elite circles of people who feels that he can dictate to the rest of us how the planet, how the universe should work. And what's so frightening about this is it's the same thing that like we talked about a moment ago, Elon Musk, his magnification of good and bad personality traits. This is exactly the same thing. This is Mark and Dreesen having an existential moment where his fear of not being able to control the rest of the planet's population is causing him to absolutely fucking lutely lose his shit. And when he talks about this, what freaks me out the most is that this is traditionally how wars have gone on. This is how people have been exterminated. This is how political bad stuff happens because the decisions don't happen in plain view. They happen because of capital, right? The Federal Reserve Bank is a private bank. We went off the gold standard for it. And I can go through history of all the examples through Europe and even ancient Greece and Rome and so forth. So what I see is that a guy who is just, his entire universe is around controlling things with capital, is losing his shit that there's a democratization going on. And that is this fear of what AI will do where any Tom, Dick, or Harry can essentially start to do things. And he's worried about it falling into hands of people who can, let's say, counterbalance his own control of capital. And for the rest of us, I, I mean, I, first of all, I love I wish I was sometimes more like Chris, and I'm not picking him. I, I mean, Chris is so chill on the way he says stuff. But I get you, very, you need to get a dog. That's, that's, I get very. I'm not upset, but I get very passionate because I my living early days was as a, a litigator and as a person who argues philosophy. I, I would never have guessed. And, and and I'm saying when I when I dealt with him in public and Gina Bianchi in public, Bianchini, it was the same thing as like that the thing that people like him hate is the light of public view, the light of public evaluation. They hate the light of facts shining on them. For him to do a manifesto seems indicative of something that must really freak him the fuck out because otherwise he doesn't need or want that kind of public scrutiny. Yeah, I, think, him. Um, I, I understand where you're coming from because I, I think he likes to see himself as this techno-intellectual well, what he really is, he's just, a, he's just a very successful businessman who doesn't want to make sure he can make more money and he doesn't want to pay any tax. Like, a, none of them want to pay any tax. It, it, it's, 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 it, it's like a king in, in the 12th century or something. The rules are for thee, not for me. All right. And what he really fears the most is exactly the situation that, like, Marie Antoinette, like, if the masses start to understand more or have more capability or more power or they can band together or whatever. So what's weird is when you read his manifesto, what's really scary about it, he's not advocating like genocide per se, but he's absolutely advocating for elitism and separatism and boxing technology away from normal people and so on and so forth. And for me, that's such an ivory tower kind of perspective because we used to have at least a perception in America between like the bottom and the top tier. And there was a graduated scales of things you could be and do. Now it's ivory tower in the sky and everybody at the bottom hoping to clamber up on some magical ladder. And there's very little in the middle right now. And so Wait. this is, you know. Right, yeah. On to a better story. Um, Kingston launches a free static site hosting for 100 websites. So, Lee, hopefully you read this one. Uh, um, what did you what, what did you think of uh, what did you think of what Kidster is up to? I think that's pretty cool. I've been seeing a lot of people using Netlify recently, which is a uh, like similar kind of a platform where you can have uh, like static sites hosted extremely affordably. 
But then I started thinking because I also re- read the the next article about charging for different services on X and everything. And I was wondering, I, I wonder where are we going with this? Like, where are we going with offering like lots of free stuff for people? Like, are we, are we trying to get more people to not actually use that and to upgrade to something that's like a traditionally hosted WordPress site that's paid? Like, like whenever I see something kind of like this, my, my first thought is, where are we going? Like, do we want more people to build static sites? Or are we trying to, or like, what's the future look like because of this announcement? Yeah. Yeah. So, it was Chris, what did you reckon of this? What's your views on this? Um, oh, you're muted, Chris, actually. Sorry about that. I think free hosting is a great idea and innovation. I mean, information wants to be free and technology. Um, trends towards free over time not always like there's no such thing as a free airplane ticket but if if you look at uh like wordpress is free you used to have to pay for a contact yeah, management system i'm sorry to interrupt but this yeah. is where we disagree chris i i think that whole that whole spiel that would well you know why it's free but um but the hosting was one of the last pieces to actually have a free website if you could get a free domain name, free web hosting, yeah. WordPress, free plugins, I think that's I think we're heading that way, and it's good to see WordPress.com has a free plan. I, I think it's really good to see a proper web host where you can map your domain name for free, uh, and then I think the next step is to have a, a some kind of free level of the domain name. And companies just have to keep innovating and figure out how to monetize. But I'm a big fan of the freemium model, and I'd love to see more hosts doing that, uh, not just static sites, so that people could more easily get started. And as soon as their projects actually starts to get traction, whether that's traffic, orders, enrollments, form submissions, whatever it is, then they have to start paying. But letting entrepreneurs yeah, I see where you're coming up like- for free is a good thing. Yeah, I see where you're coming from, Chris, but my problem with that is it's very hard to persuade somebody if they've got the notion that everything they start off with is for free, then to suddenly start charging them. And, um, that doesn't work, in my experience, that well, Chris. So, But uh, you might be right and I might be wrong. It's just, um, it's just a way of looking at things, Chris. But I don't... To, based on my experience, is the major problem with your particular stance there, Chris. But it's it's a grey area. I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, I think. I mean, I've I spent ten years doing a freemium business model, and I, I know like, you have. And uh, and Mailchimp is a great example, like free yeah. up to like whatever it is now, two hundred users or contacts. That's how Mailchimp got so big. And it's it a- did, but I also think it's not a great example of the model either, Chris. But I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, I, I'm not saying I'm probably totally wrong, Chris. I, I, I think Chris is a great example. Chris and the whole team, Kurt and everybody, will because one of the things I have to explain to people when these confusions hit immediately of what is WordPress is that there's really two models in place, but all of them are based on the same fact, which was. The software is free. It's always been free. It's still free, even if you're buying premiums, because there's three things, the software, the convenience of automatic updates, and the support. And what I love about Lifter LMS and Chris and the team and everybody else's thing is that they have sold what I believe is the new business model all along. And it's what I've been doing all along, but just not saying it that. It's that people are buying a relationship with the team at Lifter. And from there, they're paying for the premium relationship and the conveniences and the things that go along with it. And see, when you see what's going wrong right now with the premium software, everybody's losing their minds because they're trying to to sell what they should have never been selling all along was access to the software. Guys like me have been giving away the code to everybody for free because all of the people I work with understand fundamentally the software was supposed to be free anyway, and you're helping them with problems I don't have to help them with. But that's where all of this comes together is like, what really is WordPress? Chris's idea is music to my ears. You should be able to sign up for WordPress and get all the fucking software in a logical way as a platform. And from there, decide who's going to help you with it. But as it is now, it's a flea market of 70,000 vendors doing white hat and some people black hat tactics of, 
over here, over here, and pretending like they're selling software, but they're not. And they never should have been because that's yeah. in Genesis. Well, that, that's your opinion. Right. Right. That's your opinion. I, I yeah, see of course, it's my opinion. That's why I'm on the show. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't agree with it. I'm uh, um, simple as that. Um, Kurt, uh, what do you reckon? There's a saying that says a rising tide rises, raises all ships. And I want, can't help but wonder if that's like the mentality of if we give enough people, you know, that free biscuit to get started and we get every, as many more people as possible started, right? Sooner or later, they're going to realize oh, I want this e-commerce thing. I want this membership thing. I want this learning thing. I want this. And then it's off to the races to go buy stuff, right? And then where are they going to go? Well, they got the free, they got, they got the free biscuit from Kinsta. So it's an upsell opportunity for them down road. It's probably a very smart way to do business. I think about Harley Davidson and their motorcycle training classes. You know, you know, how many people start on a Buell Blast or, the, or that, you know, the tiniest Harley Davidson possible and when it's time to buy their first motorcycle, they're like, I want a road king. And they go buy a road king. Like that's, that's just the model. And, and if it's a successful model, I think Chris has exhibited his success in that area. I, I think if Kinsta is going to try it, I'm kind of excited. I want to see which, which direction it goes. Yeah. So me, um, I just wondered, you know, I'm not, I, I just find that if people, if people get stuff for free, they just don't value it. They just think it, it just becomes a total commodity, and they, 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 you know, I think Chris and his team offer enormous value. But the boy, my problem with Chris's stance, and it, and I might be totally wrong, Chris. It's just my opinion, Chris. Is that people just don't value it? You know, they just think, oh, we're getting all this for free, and it has no value. Uh, um, it's wrong. It has enormous value, but. It's just people's mentality. Or am I just an old, cynical prick, really? The, uh... I, don't, I don't think it's the latter. So I, the Chris's platform, I think it's really cool because there's such a clear upgrade path between the free stuff and the paid stuff. When I saw the static site thing, 100 static sites for free thing, it's like, is it really an upgrade path from a static site to a WordPress site? And I know you can make a static site from a WordPress site, but I just don't feel like it's that connected. Like, like Chris has this great roadmap of, hey, give this stuff, a, give it a try. See what you think. If you like it, there's more stuff that you can have. Whereas like when I got into WordPress, I did not want a static site. I never want a static site. I, I want dynamic sites. I want to be able to do stuff. And so it just seems like you're, you're bringing in a different audience. That maybe instead of having like that static GitHub page site for yourself or whatever, you know, now you have one of your own Kinsta, but like, where's the upgrade path from that to like building out like a content management platform with dynamic member content? Like, it just seems like it's such a radical shift from like a simple static site into like this dynamic, almost application that you can build for yourself. Yeah, I think it's also where Kinsta's going, Lee. I might be wrong. I think if you go to their website, they've reduced their um, marketing message about wordpress and they're really moving up up which is this is a strange because it's free but they seem to be going in marketing terms into direction but if you go to the kinsta website they've reduced the the emphasis around wordpress mm -hmm. quite considerably um so i've noticed that myself can, can i add some differentiated because lee brings up a great point but i want to merge this with what chris and everybody is doing See, the thing is with the hosts, they're in a commodity business and there's 660 plus hosts that we've been reviewing. And in those hosting, they're all selling something that has a zero value in the future. I mean, literally like text messaging, hosting has become a commodity item and they recognize it. And we've spoken so many times on the show and I'm speaking as my own business experience. That is essentially when they give away the razor blade sample, you know, the razor blade handle, razor blades. That is essentially the thing they're doing. They're saying the hosting is a way, like Kurt alluded to, to experience something. But the reality is what we're selling is the refills. We're selling, the, you know, the, the, the inkjet cartridges. And so in WordPress, the problem 
of all of these conversations is that people aren't given a clear picture. What exactly am I getting? Now, static versus dynamic, totally on board with Lee. I had a customer the other day. Static was the thing that came and went as soon as everybody had unlimited speed and unlimited bandwidth. But for a few places, maybe it makes sense. Not for the majority. For everyone else, it's a dynamic platform of curated software that does features. Just like every other thing, including go high level and Salesforce and click funnels and, you know, so that's what we're talking about is if people were given Jonathan, it's free to get on it, but you can't stay free forever. You're going to have to choose a plan for support and for updates. Then they can experience the, oh, this is like driving the car from the showroom for a couple minutes or a day, but I ultimately have to buy it or lease it or do something. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. It's just that. I just find people, and actually, that when they're receiving a lot of stuff for free, their expectations, you think they would be, you know, they would be gracious, they, they would realize, but they don't. Um, they just want more and more and more um, because they just don't value because you're giving it to them for free. Think about how you present it to them. Like, if they think going into it, it's free forever, like free like beer. No, they won't get it. But if you say it's free as in, hey, take this brand new Mercedes out for a test drive and you can try it for a day a week. But what you're going to do is buy a relationship with my company and you're paying for the support in the relationship like Lifter LMS or like WP Launch Kit. That's what people understand because they respect the fact that you're buying a premium thing, but it's not the software. And it's even not the hosting because the hosting right now, I mean, I'm able to give premium hosting for $10 a site. That's insane. But it's a cost of the you know thing I'm giving in service. It's like cost of goods sold. It's just not the software. And I think that's one of the things that will really benefit WordPress is when we clear that crap out of the air because we don't need 70,000 people making software that are platforms. We need people working. Yeah, but the problem with that argument is it's anti-competitive. You're, 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 what you're all promoting on features but not on selling the software. Well, it sounds pretty rough for the uh, Sony plug-in producers because you know, what you're saying is that they, they should only be a choose. Half of, hold on. Of you. Half of the internet runs on WordPress. Imagine if all those 70,000 people were giving a dem- an objectively fair marketplace into which to sell their specialty services, which is not being given right now, Okay. If instead of me writing these janky plugins, which are really designed surreptitiously to try to get attention, so you'll buy my software, but really I can make enough money to live. If instead I could go into that place and market my specialty expertise, by the way, using all the same software that anyone else has, it's the same skill set. It's just you're given a place where you can actually set up something that makes sense to everybody. Whereas right now, everybody's in a bazaar where they're selling one thing, but really trying to get another. Thing. Yeah, that's that's called a free open market, Spencer. It really isn't because Matt Mullenweg and the rest of the politics have indicated it's not free and open because he controls the hosting uh, page and the I think, we, I think we need to save this till next month's discussion. Oh, it's fine. Uh, I think. I'm That's why I only come here once a month. They save up all this energy. Yes, for you. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, I look forward to it so much. Uh, Robin, so uh, I think we're going to drop the next story because I, I know Chris needs to feed his dog and Kirk needs to do things. So um, That is the article that Lee clicked on. Yeah, I know. But we, you know, uh, we're, up, we're up to an hour. Uh, I think that's – I've got to respect the time of the panel. So, Lee, what's the best way for people to to find out more about you? We've got time for Lee. Uh, I guess the best place to go, um, I've got a YouTube channel that I post to weekly, which is kind of like my main online community. Um, you can just, if you go to like lee.blue slash YouTube, you'll get sent over there. So for, I guess like the main best place to go is just L-E-E dot B-L-U-E, just my name. No W's in the front, no dot coms on the end, just Lee that blue and there i am that's fantastic and kurt what's the best way for people to find out more about you and what you're up to well i am the only kurt von on on linkedin so we can connect there for sure because if you find me you know you got the right one uh manana nomas is uh everything about my agency and i have the manana nomas podcast and chris what's the best way to find out more about you and what you're up to chris I just wanted to say a, a hat tip to InstaWP. It's not exactly hosting, but they're kind of doing something similar where you can actually get started with WordPress for free. And I think they're doing a great job. 
But you can find me over at lifterlms.com. We're having a 50% off Black Friday sale that comes with $2,000 worth of bonuses that starts on November 1st. So keep an eye out for that. Check out the LMS Cast podcast. And I'm um, most easy to find on Twitter at Chris Badgett. He is. He's very um, accessible. Chris is a great guy. Um, Spencer, what's the best way to find out more about what you and what you're up to? <laughs> I'll be at anger management all week. You can find me there. Uh, you can go to WPLauncherFi.com. You can find me at Spencer Foreman on social media. Well, oh, thanks, Spencer. Um, if you want to support the show, why don't you join the WP Tonic Membership Machine Show Facebook group? Um, it's a mixture of WordPress people and people trying to build a great membership website on WordPress. And um, we will be back next month with another fantastic discussion. I've enjoyed this this month's discussion. We we'll see you soon, folks. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening. We really do appreciate it. Why not visit the Mastermind Facebook group? And also to keep up with the latest news, click wp-tonic.com forward slash newsletter. We'll see you next time.